Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snails where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our bleeding and coagulation playlist. We'll talk about hypofibronosinemia and hypoprothrombinemia. So let's get into it. Steps of hemostasis, vasoconstriction, temporary plate plug, coagulation, and then fibrolysis. And please don't forget regeneration or tissue repair or wound healing. This is going to be a key in today's lecture. How do we test for primary hemostasis? Platelet count, bleeding time, and platelet aggregometry. How do we test for secondary hemostasis? PT, PTT, and TT. Fibrolysis, FDP, and D-dimer. Primary hemostasis, platelet adhesion, platelet activation, plate. Look at this fibrinogen man. Oh, so you're saying that fibrinogen plays a role in platelet aggregation? absolutely freaking lootly. and therefore it's gonna play a role in blood coagulation yep we'll convert that fibrinogen into lovely strong fibrin fibers here is the coagulation casket extrinsic pathway intrinsic pathway and look at this fibrinogen into fibrin and then we stabilize the fibrin okay pt ptt tt boom we have discussed the clotting factors before and now let's talk about the pathology. We will go one by one and dissect each one of them. Today we'll talk about a fibrinogenemia and hypoprothrombinemia and in the next video we'll talk about factor 5 laden. Hemophilia will lead to bleeding. Hypoprothrombinemia will lead to bleeding. A fibrinogenemia can lead to bleeding or thrombosis. Factor 5 laden will lead to thrombosis. Fibrinogen, because it will cause genesis of fibrin. Fibrin, why does it end in IN? Because it's a protein. It's a fibrous protein. Love it. Nomenclature. Fibrinogen is the same as factor 1. Where did it come from? From the liver. It's one of the coagulation factors. It's one of the plasma proteins. What kind? Is it albumin or globin? It's globulin. Is it alpha globulin, beta globulin, or gamma globulin? It's beta globulin. Functions, many. Hemostasis functions, wound healing. Oh, remember, after we seal the gap, after we stop the bleeding, we need to regenerate. Oh yeah, wound healing. And also it aids in placental implantation. Can you be more specific when it comes to hemostasis? Yeah, fibrinogen will help in coagulation and fibrolysis. Oh, you mean in thrombus formation and thrombus dissolution? Absolutely. In coagulation, it helps in primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. It helps platelet aggregation and blood coagulation. Man, fibrinogen is amazing. Normal plasma fibrinogen is 200 to 400 milligrams per deliver. Notice, I said normal plasma fibrinogen, not normal serum fibrinogen, because there is no fibrinogen in the serum. Please watch my previous video on blood coagulation groups. Fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant. Translation, if you have an inflammation, any kind of inflammation, it's not shocking to see high plasma fibrinogen levels. In other words, let's suspect that Jimmy has hypofibrinogenemia and Jimmy has an acute inflammation, and then the fibrinogen level came back normal. Does this rule out hypofibrinogenemia? No, because fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant. Jimmy had an inflammation, so we expect the fibrinogen to go up. It could be that fibrinogen was down, and then he developed the acute inflammation, which normalized his serum, I'm sorry, plasma fibrinogen. So the normal fibrinogen does not rule out hypofibrinemia because fibrinogen is a freaking acute phase reactant. This was physiology. Now it's time for pathology. Fibrinogen disorders, quantitative or qualitative or both. It also could be inherited or acquired, but there is no such thing as both. Oh, doctor, I have a disease. It's both inherited and acquired. I'm sure I'm in the psych ward. I'm not making fun of patients, I'm just trying to make medicine easy for you. Fibrogen disorders, inherited or acquired, inherited, that's an import error. Acquired liver disease and DIC. Why liver disease? Because liver is the source of fibrinogen. No liver, no fibrinogen. Why DIC? It's called disseminated intravascular coagulation. Oh, actually, I consumed all of my clotting factors, including fibrinogen. Fibrinogen disorders could be quantitative, qualitative, or both. Quantitative, a fibrinogenemia, hypofibrinogenemia, or hyperfibrinogenemia. Hypofibrinogenemia, fibrinogen is low. A fibrinogenemia, fibrinogen is no. Hyper, it's high. 
Let's look at the qualitative defect. We have this fibrinogen. What does this mean? Dysfunction. Do you remember primary ciliary dyskinesia? Yeah, difficulty of kinesis, of movement. So this one is a problem in number, but this one is a problem in function. How about hypo dysfibrogen? Oh, that's both, baby. A problem with the number and a problem with the function of fibrinogen. Cryofibrinogenemia. This is abnormal fibrinogen at cold temperature. The fibrinogen precipitates in the plasma at low temperature. Do you think it's reversible or irreversible? Of course, it's reversible when you reverse the temperature. Fibrinogen, physiology versus pathology. Okay, physiology, primary hemostasis. Therefore, fibrinogen pathology, um, bleeding and bleeding time could be prolonged, also could be normal. Secondary hemostasis was the function of fibrinogen. Oh, no fibrinogen. Bleeding, prolonged PT, PTT, and TT, thrombin time. Fibrinolysis, oh, thrombosis, whoops. Wound healing and tissue regeneration, this was step number five in hemostasis. But in pathology, you have abnormal wound healing, delayed wound healing, and surgical wound dehiscence. Function of fibrinogen, placental implantation, no fibrinogen, obstetric complications, bleeding, or thrombosis, or pregnancy loss. But hey, medicosis, I have a question. How come fibrinogen is pro-hemostasis and pro-fibrinolysis at the same time? Isn't that oxymoronic? Oh, shut up. It's actually genius. The answer is not in medicine, it's in economics. Economics is the study of the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses. Scarce and alternative. To illustrate this point, let me tell you about Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America. For about half a century, until World War II, it produced, look at this, look at this, all the virgin, whatever, aluminum in the United States. All. So, if you haven't studied economics before, you will say, Oh, I bet they made unconscionable, greedy profits. And the price of aluminum just went through the roof because they could do whatever they wanted. Well, actually, the annual profit rate on investment was about 10%. But, but the price of aluminum must have skyrocketed. Well, actually, the price of aluminum decreased over that period. But, 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 but how come I don't get it? Well, you didn't account for substitutes. If they jacked up the price too much, whatever we could have produced from aluminum, now we can make from steel, we can make from tin, etc., etc., etc. Remember, alternative uses. Hey, doctor, I haven't eaten any carbohydrates in the last two days. I'm gonna starve to death. Chill your butt down. Your body can make ATP from carbohydrates, from fats, or from proteins. Substitutes, baby. The first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to fully satisfy all those who want it. There is never enough of fibrinogen to satisfy both procoagulation and anticoagulation activities. Therefore, we have to economize. It's called supply and demand, baby. Look at the demand curve. It has a D. It goes to the dirt. It goes downwards. But supplies to the sky. Let's say for some reason people loved ice cream because it's summertime. The demand will increase. Shift to the right, baby. And now the demand curve is like this. Now the new point of equilibrium is here. What happened to the price of ice cream? It went up. When the price goes up, supplier will say, oh, it's actually more profitable to make ice cream now. Let's make more ice cream. So we will use milk, which is a scarce resource that has alternative uses to make more ice cream and less yogurt or cheese. Now let's talk about ice cream suppliers, the yellow line. Look at this. Here was the equilibrium, now the equilibrium is this. What happened to the quantity supplied? It went from here to here, so it increased. They will supply more ice cream because it's more profitable to them. At that point, people will say, oh, ice cream is so expensive right now, I might as well buy less ice cream and more yogurt slash cheese. So the demand curve will shift back to the original green line. And the point will go from here to here, dropping the price again to the original level. And that's why we have prices in the economy. To economize the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses. So we get it, Medicosis. Economics is just study of goods and services. No, wrong. The Garden of Eden was also a system for production and distribution of goods and services, but it was not an economy. Why not? Because everything was available in an unlimited abundance. There was no scarcity, and without scarcity, 
there is no need to economize. Both of these scenarios happen in economics, they also happen in your human body. We can have many products leading to the same purpose. We can have aluminum, steel, or tin producing, I don't know, canned tuna or something. Or we can have the same product, milk, making cheese, yogurt, ice cream, sour cream, etc. And there you go. But how is that related to medicine? Good things happen to those who wait. An example of substitutes is your body making ATP from carbohydrates, fat, or protein. An example of one product producing many purposes like milk, producing cheese, yogurt, etc. is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen can help you make a thrombus. It can also help you dissolute a thrombus because it's a scarce resource which have alternative uses. Same thing happens with thrombin. Thrombin can help fibrinogen make a thrombus. It can also bind to thrombomodulin and this will help thrombus dissolution. But I still don't get it. Isn't this a contradiction? Well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. It's a scarce resource with alternative uses. If you want to make a clot, oh yeah, thrombin, look, fibrogen, make a clot. If you want to break down the clot, look at this. Okay, if you're trying to break down the clot, what are you trying to achieve? Oh, I'm trying to decrease anything that's pro-coagulation and to increase anything that's anti-coagulation and pro-fibrinolysis. Cool. What if there was a way to achieve both goals? Two birds with one stone. Oh yeah, tell me. That would be great. Thrombin thrombomodulin complex. Okay, thrombin thrombomodulin, this is something that will like, is anticoagulation? Yes. Okay, and then there is less thrombin available to make a clot. Oh, because we took it away, we consumed it in the thrombin thrombomodulin complex so that we can be anticoagulation while having less thrombin floating around to become pro-coagulation. Your body is a freaking economic genius. If your professor explained it like this, I will retire from medical education and I will work as a plumber. Both of them have to do with surgical techniques. There's no difference between a clogged pipe and a clogged coronary. You just gonna bust it away, man. Oh yeah, that's why we call fibrinolytics clot busters. Signs and symptoms of fibrinogen disorders. Bleeding. Oh yeah. Thrombosis. Oh yeah, because it helps in fibrinolysis. Normal wound healing is it? No, it's not there. It's abnormal wound healing. And don't forget obstetric complications. Diagnosis, bleeding time could be prolonged, could be normal. Prolonged, PT, PTT, and TT. Plasma fibrinogen is low. Amino assays and functional assay can help us diagnose the problem. A problem with fibrinogen number, a problem with fibrinogen function. How do we manage those fibrinogen disorders? What did the used car salesman say? No cash, no problem. No symptoms, no treatment. Give fibrinogen if there is like a problem. High risk of bleeding and low plasma fibrinogen. Example, what should I give? Fibrinogen concentrate, this is the best choice. And the trade name is Fibrina. Formerly, now it's called Fibriga. Fibrina should be the name of my future daughter. I freaking love it when you call me, Fi. Other choices include cryoprecipitate and fresh frozen plasma. Why is fibrinogen the number one choice? Oh, because it just contains fibrinogen. While cryoprecipitate contains four things, fresh frozen plasma contains like almost everything in the plasma, including the antibodies. So there is just a higher risk of side effects here. This is the pure specialization, man. Adam Smith was right, baby. Oh, and by the way, let's say I suffer from hypodysfibrinogenemia. Who should I go to? A family doctor? Oh, give me a break. The guy who measures my blood pressure and my rectal temperature. Do you think he's gonna diagnose my hypodysfibrinogenemia? It ain't gonna happen, baby. I need to go to a super sophisticated nerd, a hematologist who specify in rare bleeding diatheses. Adam Smith was right. Hypoperthrombinemia, we have inherited and acquired, this is factor 2. Inherited is inborn, acquired lupus anticoagulant, O, oh, and aspirin overdose. For symptoms, diagnosis, and management, apply the same concept that we learn in hypofibrinogenemia. And by the way, no matter how many textbooks you read, hypoperthrombinemia is rarely mentioned. You can get my antibiotic scores by going to my website, medicosisperfectionalist.com. Thank you for watching, you bloody lovely people. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Get my antibiotic scores and many other courses at my website. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist, where medicine makes perfect sense.